for our launch event, we would start with the oceans, since after all, the, the planet is a blue planet. The Earth is a blue planet. We normally get to hear more about ocean from ocean conservation organizations, but we thought that this would be a great opportunity to hear from a scientific organization, because hopefully those ocean conservation organizations are using research and science based on scientific based on their um, research and science efforts. The Fallon Institute is an amazing scientific organization dedicated to understanding and preservation of healthy marine ecosystems. The research is designed to promote the science bases for ecosystem-based management practices and policy reforms consistent with a productive marine world. Um, we are thrilled that Jeff Dorman, the executive director and principal scientist from the Farallon Institute was able to take time to talk to us this evening about the current state of the oceans globally and locally. So what we thought we'd have them do is do a discussion for about 30 minutes and that will leave us time for questions and discussion. We'll have another 30 minutes after that. Will that work? Okay. 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 Thanks. All right. Alexander, are you ready for me now? Yeah. Yep. All right. Here we go, folks. Uh, let's make sure this gets working properly. And can everyone see the state of the ocean slide? Just the slide there? It looks like you're in um, nodes mode. Really? Yeah. We had it right earlier. Yeah, interesting. Let's try again. There we go. Better? Yep. I don't know what's different about it, but thanks. So uh, first of all, thanks everyone for the invitation to present here. Um, like Alexandra said, uh, my name is Jeff Dorman. I'm the executive director of Farallon Institute. And this is really sort of a talk series that we started over the last five years called State of the Ocean, where we like to go out and take what we know as sort of the latest knowledge of what's happening in the ocean, translate it a little bit and present it to general public audiences and try to engage people with what's happening in ocean research. Um, my background in the ocean, I've been studying uh, oceanography on the west coast of the United States for about 20 years. And most of that really focused on krill, trying to understand what drives krill productivity, um, you know, how climate change might influence krill. And at Farallon Institute, we do broadly, we look at the whole ocean ecosystem from climate all the way up to top predators and try to understand what are the drivers of the ecosystem and where's it going, particularly where's it going under climate change. So I thought I'd share with you just a, a couple of, of light things to start. First, happy Earth Day. Uh, my wife sent me an email this morning uh, from Alan Murray from Fortune. And in that email were some, some, uh, some facts that I thought was, were interesting and a little inspiring. Uh, first off, more than 70% of people uh, like to work for companies or stay with companies that have a good reputation on the environment. 55% of people will pay more for brands that are sustainable and environmentally responsible. And 48% of investors take some level of environmental sustainability into consideration in their portfolios. And finally, I thought this was very interesting that 84% of CEOs say that sustainability will be an important part of their 2022 strategic direction. Just four years ago, that was only 32%. And I think that has to be related to, we've seen uh, the global impact that COVID has had on us. We, we understand the impact that these global problems like climate change can have on the world. And so I think people, I think we're at a very unique time and place where people are starting to adjust to that. Um, and I'll just highlight this. When I, when I logged in the New York Times this morning, I think you can all see my mouse here, but I'm sure all of you have heard uh, Joe Biden has committed the U.S. to having greenhouse gas emissions by 20, 2030. This is a wild change. This is a, a new direction. And it's really exciting if we're going to get a handle on understanding how climate change impacts the environment. Um, yeah, so I'll kick it off. I like to kick it off with a little bit of sort of what connects us to the ocean, right? And for some people, it might be uh, the things they eat out of the ocean. I know Dungeness crab, particularly on the West Coast, um, is something, a bit of a holiday tradition. It's something that people enjoy with their families. Um, that's changed a lot over the last couple of years just because of issues with when we can harvest crabs safely. 
Um, but understanding, you know, we're connected to the ocean through the food we eat out of it. If any of you have gone out to Tamales Bay and had a plate of oysters with a friend at the Marshall store on a beautiful sunny afternoon, uh, it's hard not to feel connected to the ocean that we live next to. And I think Northern Californians do feel connected. Um, this is a classic image of the fishing boats in Bodega Bay, all fogged in. Um, the, the fishing industry, the, the aquaculture industry, provides a tremendous amount of support to the, particularly the North Coast of California, where there isn't a whole lot of other industry. And so at Fairline Institute, we believe very strongly in sort of, uh, we don't believe in not fishing, we believe in sustainably fishing and sustaining these industries. And even if you don't eat seafood, uh, even if you don't go out on the water, I think all of us can relate to being at the beach, to walking on the beach, to playing in the ocean. Uh, this is my daughter and a friend. And what I love about this is this was probably a beautiful, sunny summer day out at Limitor Beach. And she's wearing uh, hoodies, long underwear, and, and a hat. Uh, classic Northern California day. But part of what connects us, uh, connects us to the ocean. And Farallon is too, what we do is we do oceanographic research for sustainable and healthy oceans. And I wanna break that down. Um, almost everyone who works at Farallon Institute has a PhD. We do scientific research um, and we publish that in, in top journals uh, in the scientific community. But we don't just do research for the sake of doing it. We do it, um, really we try to tie our research into management actions. How can this help this organization better manage, whether it be a fishery or maybe it's a marine protected area or maybe it's a national marine sanctuary. Um, but we try to tie our research in there and then we all take time as scientists and serve on those bodies as well. We have people serving on federal fishery boards, on state fishery boards. I'm on one of the national marine sanctuary boards. Uh, it's really an amazing group of people who are pretty committed to both doing the research and making sure that the decision-making happens with the best available science. Um, Broadly speaking, the way I, this is sort of a, a Venn diagram which shows what Farallon Institute works on. And traditionally, fisheries management has really happened right here around these two circles. It's happened around fish and it's happened around fisheries. And it's kind of said, well, if we know what the population of the fish was this year, we can decide how much we can take out next year. And over the last 20 years, there's been a big movement in fisheries science to take it to another level because we know that just because there were a lot of fish last year, that doesn't take into account maybe the temperature of the ocean or maybe the prey resources in the ocean. And so Farallon Institute really takes a step back from this and we try to work with the climate. We try to work and understand the ocean. Uh, what's not circled, we try to work here on the plankton to understand the prey resource, how it's driven and how that really drives fish and fisheries and put all those together. Today, what I'm going to do is I'll, t I'll talk about two things. I'd like to break these talks first into talking about the global ocean. <laughs> Excuse me. And then I'll just give a couple local stories about what's happening in our local ocean today and try to talk about why it's happening, what we understand scientifically, what we don't understand scientifically, and where that's going. Um, from the global ocean perspective, uh, if we were all live in person, uh, I would sit there and I would probably say, what's the number one thing people think about when they when they think about the global ocean? And the number one thing that everyone always says is plastics, the one on the left there. Uh, plastics is top of mind. It's gotten a lot of attention in the press. And it is a, a big issue uh, going on in ocean sciences, ocean conservation today. Uh, the second one I put in there, particularly because I'm sure some of you have seen this film, uh, it's out on Netflix and being pushed very hard, or, or whether it's being pushed or not, people are watching it, called Sea Spiracy, all about overfishing. Um, and then finally, the one that I'll probably spend the most time on is climate change. Uh, climate change, and, and I say that because while the other two impact uh, levels, basically fishing to, operates on the top trophic level, plastics operates on individual organisms in some sense, Climate change really impacts both the organisms and the way they live. It impacts the ocean they live in, the atmosphere. It's really all encompassing. And so it's a lot of what drives our interest in our research. And I'm really just going to touch on these. Um, any one of these topics could probably be an hour conversation in their own right. And I'd be happy to, to talk in more depth over questions. Uh, so plastics in the ocean is a, is a really interesting one because ever since the public, publication of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, 
Um, it's gotten a lot of attention. And when we think about plastics in the ocean, we kind of think about an image like this, a beach strewn with plastic. Um, and I spent a lot of time out on the ocean, sailing the ocean, and you don't see that as much when you're out on the ocean. And that's because plastics tend to break down. They get very brittle in the sunlight. They also sink out. The bigger pieces tend to sink out. And so when you take a net and you, you tow it along the surface of the ocean, you often get something more like this, where the biggest piece in here is probably the size of your pinky, pinky uh, fingernail. It's not very big at all and it's very broken down. Um, but at the end of the day, this plastic is getting, and, and in some ways that makes it much harder to deal with. Um, we produce about 300 million tons of plastic every year and about 8 million tons ends up in the ocean. And that's year after year after year. Um, and 50% of that plastic that's produced is only used one time. So plastic is, is a pervasive problem in the ocean. And one of the issues is that everything eats it out there. When it's floating on the surface of the water, um, birds will swoop down and pick it up. And this is a very a classic image of a bird that had a, a, this is all the plastic that was found in this bird's stomach. Um, there's birds that spend, like albatross, can spend years just never touching ground. They just, sit, they just soar over the ocean and they, they feed by just dropping down and picking things out of the ocean. So they get a lot of plastic in their bodies. Turtles and fish will eat a lot of plastics as well. And those are organisms that are selectively feeding, but there's also lots of organisms that filter the, filter the ocean water, like these barnacles here, they filter the ocean. Krill, which is what I study, they filter the ocean. This is an organism called a larvation, and they filter the ocean. There's been over 700 documented organisms that they found plastic in their bodies. So it's a ubiquitous problem. Um, and it's definitely something that's really going to be solved um, probably as a source issue by, by reducing our plastic use, by making sure this plastic is not getting into the ocean in the first place. And there's a lot of groups working on that, um, and it's, it's certainly something that a lot of people are paying attention to and making progress on. Um, the second topic, and, and really I'm going to be fairly brief on this, is overfishing. And has, has anyone, by show of hands, has anyone seen Sea Spiracy? Has anyone watched it in the last couple of days? No. So it's, uh, it, there's a lot of information out there on the internet already. Some fishery scientists think it, it may be over-dramatized a bit, and you can find that just by looking it up. But I want you to focus at the, on the map on the right. This is global fishing activity um, in 2016. And there's a couple of things. This is the number of kilometers, I think, uh, number of hours fishing per kilometer square. There's a couple of things you can see. Is one is that uh, the coasts are fished very heavily, right? That's where most of the fishing occurs. That's number one. But two, what really surprised me is how much fishing happens throughout the world's oceans. And these areas where it's not fished, that's just because it's not very productive and it's not worth their time going there. It's not because it's too far to get to, because areas that are so far from land are being fished. Um, and then you see these, these holes in the ocean, like here and here and here. And some of these are protected areas, open ocean protected areas. And others are areas that have, you know, each country has a 200 mile exclusive economic zone around it. And it may be a country that doesn't let foreign, foreign fishing fleets into their EEZ or their exclusive economic zone. And so fishing, overfishing is certainly a problem in the world. Um, I think a lot of U.S. US fisheries scientists would say, hold on a minute, because we do a pretty good job at managing our fisheries. We're not perfect, um, but sustainable fisheries, to have sustainable fisheries, you need four things. You really need a data collection mechanism. You need to understand what's happening in the environment. You need to then have scientists to analyze that data in the, in the proper ways. You need the political will to make the decisions for your fisheries based on the best, best available science. Uh, and then you need enforcement and you need some level of repercussions if you don't, if you do break those rules. And we're fortunate here in the United States to have all of those things. Um, what's amazing is that we put a lot of effort into fisheries management and we still don't have it right. And that's primarily because we don't understand, we don't, we don't have quite enough data as a scientist. A scientist would say we never have enough data, but we don't have enough data to make the proper decisions. And so even with all the resources that we have in the United States that we put forth in fisheries management, we don't have the ability to properly manage all of our fisheries. But that said, 
I think we do a good job. If you take that same puzzle to a country that's not uh, doesn't have the same economic resources, uh, it's very hard to manage those fisheries properly. So, um, the third and, and sort of biggest thing I want to talk about is is climate change, and we are putting a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, uh, and that has an impact. Um, I've often thought that I really um, I'd like to do a scientific talk across disciplines where I take the top 10 plots that I think everyone should see, like classic graphs that are always out there. And these would certainly be some of them from the atmospheric sciences. Um, the plot on the left, both of these show carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, the one on the left shows carbon dioxide over almost the last million years. And it was taken from an ice core in Antarctica. They went down and they extracted the air that was trapped in the, in the ice core over the last 800,000 years. And they were able to, to figure out the CO2 composition that was in the atmosphere when that ice was, was frozen solid and sealed off. And there's a couple of things to note here. Um, whenever you have these low amounts of carbon dioxide, these all coincided with ice ages. So these are the ice ages over the last 800,000 years. And just to give you a little context, you know, the earth has been around for 4.5, 4.7 billion years. Uh, this is, we're talking about 1 million years. Sharks have been around on our earth for 450 million years. So this is really, it seems like a long time, almost a million years, but it's really a, a pretty short record. And humans came into the picture about here, about at 200,000 years ago. And so you can see there's, you know, we, we're pretty much generally between 175 and 300 parts per million until the Industrial Revolution begins. And then we begin to put a lot more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, really reaching unprecedented levels. The plot on the right is called the Keeling Curve, and it was named after um, Charles Keeling. Uh, Charles Keeling was a research scientist at Scripps Institute of Oceanography, and he wanted to find a place somewhere in the world where he could measure carbon dioxide um, away from all the sources. And he set up an observatory uh, on Mauna Loa, Mauna, Mauna Loa in Hawaii. And for about 70 years, they've been measuring atmospheric carbon up there. And you can see a steady rise from 300 and just below 320 when he started, uh, all the way up above 400 at present. And this has been, uh, this was a, a scientific experiment that really, um, I think proved that, that what we're doing is we're putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and, and really set the groundwork for understanding how that was changing the atmosphere. And the other really interesting thing, if you've never seen this, and I think this is really neat, is that there's a sawtooth pattern that happens every year. And come about April to May, the carbon dioxide begins to decrease in the atmosphere. And it's not because we're not putting it in at the same rate, but that's because the northern forest, the, the northern hemisphere has so much forest that all the tree growth takes more carbon out of the atmosphere than we're putting, uh, than we're putting into the atmosphere. And I think that's, that's just a really amazing thing. It's amazing that plants are out there bringing in carbon dioxide enough to offset all the carbon dioxide we're putting into the atmosphere at that same time. Um, all this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has a big impact. It warms uh, the atmosphere and it also warms the ocean. This is the global ocean temperature anomaly from 1880 uh, through about 2020. And so the average temperature is this zero line right here. And this was taken um, the average of all these years. And then the anomaly is the difference in any one year from this average temperature of all the years. So you can see the last time the anomaly was below the average was back in the late 1970s. And since then, the ocean continues to warm and continues to warm. Um, so we're definitely changing the heat content of the ocean. What's really um, interesting, I think, is that the water has a much higher um, ability to absorb heat than the atmosphere does. And so we can keep warm, we warm the atmosphere by putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And then that heat immediately uh, absorbs into the ocean and warms the ocean. And the ocean doesn't go up in temperature nearly as much because of the heat capacity of water is so much greater than the heat capacity of air. If we didn't have the ocean to absorb all this heat, and the ocean is absorbed about 93% of the heat due to climate change, uh, the average surface temperature of 
Earth would be over 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Right now, the average surface temperature, global temperature, is about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So the ocean has taken up almost all of the heat that we've put in, into the atmosphere. Uh, without the ocean, it would be quite uncomfortable here on planet Earth. Um, and that has an impact. It, the warming the ocean, you know, the plot on the left shows that we are pretty much warming the global ocean no matter where. This is, again, the change in sea surface temperature in degrees Fahrenheit throughout the world's ocean. Uh, that is happening. It, it's very evident that that's happening. Um, another aspect of global warming is that we're also uh, making the ocean more acidic. So when you put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, that carbon dioxide also uh, dissolves into the ocean and forms with water carbonic acid. And so the ocean is certainly becoming more acidic, and I like to call this sort of the other problem of, of climate change. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what that does. Warming the ocean has huge impacts on many, many things. I think first and foremost that we talk about a lot has a huge impact on our weather. Um, this is the first time we had three named hurricanes uh, in the Atlantic. I think this was 2017. Uh, this image shows Hurricane Katia near Mexico. This is Hurricane Irma near Cuba here. Um, and Jose approaching the Windward Islands. Uh, Hurricane Irma was huge. It's the one that ran over Barbuda, the British Virgin Islands, and then the Florida Keys. Um, we're on about five or six straight hurricane seasons where we've had a hurricane uh, before the season officially started. So hurricane season is moving earlier in the year. And these hurricanes are getting more and more intense. We've had four or five straight years with a Category 5 hurricane making land. All of that we know is because we're making the ocean warmer and that fuels these storms. And it's not just hurricanes, it's other weather phenomenon as well. We understand when we have an El Nino year here off California, that changes our weather patterns. We get tend to get more rain, particularly in Southern California. And the same is happening as we warm our ocean, we're changing weather patterns around the world. Um, it has huge implications for both big storms as well as droughts, as well as where it rains. So, um, that's probably, that's one of the biggest uh, impacts that we all feel around the globe. You know, in the ocean, there's huge biological impacts. And I think most people tend to think of the biological impacts at these top levels. So the, the image on the left is a Humboldt squid. Um, they tend to migrate up into the, from Baja, up along our coast, and they're voracious predators. These can change whole food webs. They, they stay down deep, but they can eat lots and lots of hake which is the number one commercial fishery off California. Um, when we have El Nino years, we have lots of warm water coming up towards our coast. And we get uh, sports, sport species like marlin or sailfish uh, and dorado coming up from Mexico. So we know that if we warm the ocean, we're gonna get rain shifts. Those bring these different predators into contact and they change food webs. They change how energy flows through food webs. Um, we often don't think, as scientists we do, but I don't think the public necessarily thinks about what happens to the smaller organisms. And I think this is, this is one of my favorite plots, and I'll take a minute to explain it, but these are copepods that you see here. They're one of the most ubiquitous animals in the ocean, perhaps the most numerous. Everything feeds on copepods if you're small enough at some life stage. Um, and this is a study off Oregon that looked at the community composition of copepods. Were they more northern copepods, which are bigger, these are up here, or were they more southern copepods, which are smaller? And this, these also have a lot of oils. They're very rich in food. And so we like to sort of think of them this way, as these top ones are very fatty and big. If you eat those, and you're going to get big fast, and you're going to survive. And if you get all these little ones, you may eat the same number, but you're not going to survive. And so... We had a very warm period along our coast from 2014 here uh, on up through 2018. And you see the composition shifted entirely away from northern or away from the cheeseburger copepods and into the southern. And this has these these indices right here, these copepod indices have huge impacts on salmon survival. The salmon that come out of the rivers of Oregon. If you have a lot of these cheeseburger copepods, they survive very well. If you don't, they don't. And so warm conditions can have big influences very low on the food web. And then this is what I work on. I work on krill. Uh, this is an image from a study off of Trinidad, California. But again, you have 2007 to 2018. You've got this warm period here. And this is the size of krill, the body length. 
So you can still have krill, but they're not in this warm period, they're not 15 millimeters anymore. They're 10 millimeters. They're little and they pack a little, when you eat them, you get less energy from it. And so again, this has been linked to salmon survival and I'm sure it's linked to other organism survival. Warmer conditions generally lead to a less productive food web. And that's certainly true for the California coast. Um, this gets away from California, but again, we're trying to talk global here. Um, I'm sure many of you know that warmer oceans lead to coral bleaching. This is when coral expel um, a symbiotic algae that gives them their color, and so they look white. Um, and this happens under really, really warm conditions. And so this doesn't only kill the corals, um, but the corals really provide the structure for these coral reefs where many, many organisms live. Uh, without the corals there, the habitat is not there. And these are some of the most biodiverse places on earth, just as rainforests are as well. So corals don't have an ability to move and adapt. They don't have the ability to have a range shift. Um, and so this is a, this is a really big problem for, for tropical parts of the world. And if you haven't, I highly recommend this documentary. Um, this is done by Jeff Orlowski. Um, he also did a documentary called Chasing Ice, which was about documenting glacier receding and he most recently did the social the social dilemma um, as well which is on the power of social media so all are great but if you want to watch a great documentary about doing science and about trying to capture the story i highly recommend uh chasing coral it's a great it's a great movie great documentary and then this is the other side um you know ocean acidification so any as as we as i said before as you put uh as you put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, it diffuses into the ocean and that forms carbonic acid. And that inhibits the secretion and the creation of calcium carbonate skeletons. And so that could be the calcium carbonate skeleton of a coral reef, um, of any kind of mollusk, like a, like a oyster or a clam of any sort, as well as the exoskeletons of, of lobster and krill and copepods, anything that has an exoskeleton or a shell um, this is something where there's been a lot of lab work done on how organisms develop under more acidic conditions. Um, but it's really a little bit unknown how this is going to impact the ocean and it's probably a little bit further away. But um, it's sort of, as I like to think of it, the other ocean, is, uh, the other climate change problem, but equally, equally important in some ways, but just a little further off the impacts, I think. So that's global. Um, and that's sort of, you know, there's, there's a lot out there from a, particularly from a climate change perspective that's impacting our ocean, that's changing our ocean. I think as scientists, we, we try not to think of the ocean as a static place and it isn't, it's always changing. Um, and climate change has just really pushed that change in one direction over the last, over the last 20, 30, 40 years. Um, I do, it, it can be a little depressing, so I want to come back here and show you this again. Biden has committed to having greenhouse gases by 2030. I think that's pretty amazing. And that's, you know, that's not something I've been able to say while giving this talk. I think there's been very little interest in that sort of legislation or that sort of push at the federal level for the last um, four or five years. And it's hard to get done. Will it get done? I don't know, but it is exciting. Um, so for the rest of the time, I'm, I'm probably going to talk for just about 10 more minutes, and I'd like to tell you about two stories that, that sort of fall in the wheelhouse of what we do at Farallon Institute, and they involve physical forcings, they involve understanding how the ecosystem works, particularly the first story, which is about the red abalone fishery um, off California. And for those of you um, who've never been abalone diving, I recommend never going abalone diving. It's, just, it's, just, it's you go up to the north coast of California and you get in water that's cold, typically rough, uh, and you usually can't see much past the, your hand out here. It's a very, um, <laughs> it's fun in a, sort, in a sort of weird way, but you go in the water and you're only allowed to free dive. You're not allowed to, to take tanks with you and you dive down and you, search around in the rocks and hopefully you find an abalone that's of the legal size and you pop it off. And that's all the hard stuff. When you get back in, you get to cook it and eat it. And, it, and really they're, they're amazingly delicious. And it's really abalone fishing on the North coast of California is something I was fortunate to do over the last 20 years. And um, it's a, it's very much a community event. People go with their families, people go with their friends. 
they camp or they stay in hotels and it's a really wonderful um, it's a wonderful thing. There's only a recreational fishery. There is no commercial fishery. And over the time I've been abalone diving, the number has gone, the number that you can take per season has gone from 100. Um, all the way down in 2014, they limited to 12. So there's been this decline in the amount you're allowed to take as they've conservatively tried to manage the abalone fishery. And then in 2018, and really it's, I'm, I'm going to you know, tell you the punchline, but it's really in response to that warming period I talked about in 2014, the abalone fishery was closed. And uh, I continued to give that this talk. And in 2019, they closed it until 21. And just recently, the abalone fishery was closed until 2026. So this is almost a 10 year run where the abalone fishery is going to be closed for the northern coast of California. Um, this has a huge impact. This is a, a red abalone on the left there. They just have a single shell and you use a pry bar like what you see up here um, to pop them off the rock and use a gauge to make sure they're legal size. But this is a huge part of the recreational industry off for this region. It provides a lot of economic, uh, economic engine for the area as well. So the closure of this fishery for 10 years has big impacts on the small towns along the Northern California coast. And so we want to understand sort of why it's happening and, and uh, can we either, you know, change that or can we predict when it's going to happen so we can plan better for it. And this is the main food source of red abalone, which is bull kelp. So this is what it looks like on the surface. This is an algae. It's a big algae that grows up from the bottom. Uh, this is what it looks like underwater. It's got this long sort of, I'm going to call it a stem with a big air bladder right here, which lifts up these fronds all the way up into the light. And so they collect a lot of energy, it grows very fast. And it's an annual plant. Basically every year, this will die back to some extent. It'll release new spores that grow again the next spring and it'll grow all back. So there is a seasonal cycle to this. But this is mainly the main food source of red abalone. And you can see here the plot on the left in 2008, these are four different coves, areas along the Northern coast. And the green shows uh, the coverage of kelp. So in 2008, we had pretty good kelp cover all along in 2014, 15, and 16. A lot of that kelp coverage was gone entirely from certain places. So you have areas that look like this on the surface go to this. You've got what were healthy ecosystems tend to be just rotting stalks at the end and abalone are pretty much gone from these areas. And the ones that are there are even smaller within their shell because of sort of the lack of food. And this really happened because in 2014, we had an event which scientists uh, very scientifically nicknamed the blob. So the blob happened and you may have heard about it, it got reported literally as the blob. There were whole conferences on the blob. Um, but in the North Pacific, there was a, a ridge of high pressure which set up over the North Pacific Typically in the wintertime, you have lots of storms moving through, mixing down the top layer and mixing the water. And those storms just got pushed to the north. And so the, the, the sun just heated the surface layer. And this stratification, this really warm lens set up on the surface. And this is three degrees Fahrenheit, normal, more, no, more warm than normal. So that's about six degrees no, three degrees centigrade. Sorry, so that's about six degrees Fahrenheit. This is a really warm blob of water. And it eventually came up right here along the shore. And it lasted for about a year. And then in 2016, we had an El Nino, which also brings warm water. So basically 2014 to 16, we had these really warm years, uh, particularly along the California coast, but really all through the North Pacific. Um, at the same time, there was a virus that went through the sea star population. It was called sea star wasting disease. And it may have been exacerbated by the warm water to some degree, uh, or it may have happened anyway. That's a, a little unknown. But you can see here, this, these plots show 2003 through 2018. So sea stars were somewhat in decline, but as of 2014, they were almost gone from the population. And sea stars, while we think of them as they're beautiful animals, we don't really think of them as predators. They're actually predators. They eat a lot of clams. They eat a lot of sea urchins. And so with the removal of this predator, you can see what happened to the urchin population that had always been kept in check. It goes off the charts. And urchins are grazers. They crawl around on rocks and they scrape off whatever's there. And that includes new kelp spores that get deposited. And so in these years, we had lots of urchins. If you look at this density number, 
This is the number per meter squared. So you could have up to 20 urchins just in one meter square and 20 more in the next meter square. So these are a lot of urchins. Um, and it didn't happen overnight, but you can see, you know, with the lack of kelp over years, the abalone population continues to decline. And so this is a combination of warm conditions, a virus removing a top predator. Um, and if we look here, this is a this is a really neat plot, I think, just because this is someone measuring kelp coverage from space using satellites all the way back from 1985. So this shows the latitude here from Jenner to Point Arena all the way up to Fort Bragg. From 1985 all the way through present, the kelp coverage in these areas. And you can see right here, 2014, there's some kelp, there's a little bit of kelp here and there, but overall the kelp is gone. And so what we're left with are what we're calling urchin barrens. And right now there's a lot of people working on how do we reverse this? And there's people out there actually collecting urchins, trying to kill off the urchins. Um, that's probably not feasible on a large scale. They're trying to clear areas where at least sort of refuges for bull kelp so kelp can grow back. Um, and there's a lot, of, a lot of science being done trying to understand why this happened in the first place. We've gone from this very healthy population sort of to an alternative stable state where it's going to be very hard to get out of this state without some major perturbation. And so maybe that happens through physical events that come through, oceanographic things that happen. Maybe it's a virus going through the purple, uh, purple urgent population but we're sort of in this stable state that's gonna be very hard to get out of. And there's a lot of people, including a lot of our scientists, working on understanding why this happened and what, if anything, we can do about it to, to change it. The second thing I wanna talk about, um, and this has been all over the news, are these four dead whales that washed ashore on San Francisco Bay Area beaches over the last month. Um, on April 1st, an adult female was found. April 3rd, another adult female. And then on April adult, uh, on April 8th, two more males. Uh, well, excuse me, one male and one female. And they've done, the Marine Mammal Center has done uh, necropsies on all of these. And two of them were pretty conclusive right away that they died from blunt force trauma. And that typically means that they were out foraging at the surface and they got hit by a ship that passed by. Um, this happens and it happens on the heels of an unusual mortality event. This is a, a term that NOAA uses when something odd is happening in the ocean. And from 2019 to current, we're in the middle of an unusual mortality event for gray whales. The plot here on the bottom, um, this line here shows the average 18 year average of stranding over the course of the year from January. February, March. There's always a few more strandings in April and May. This is in California, Oregon, Washington, and Alaska. But in 2019 in orange, you can see there were a lot of strandings. In 2020 in green, there were a lot of strandings. So far in 2021, there's only a couple months of data, it's been more normal. And so, and this is the location of all the strandings, even from Baja up the coast into Canada and Alaska. Um, the reason they think, they haven't fully declared this, but the 2019 and 20 strandings, many of the whales they examined were emaciated. They had very little food in their bellies and they probably were starving. And that's probably why, and there were poor oceanographic conditions at that point. Um, but that's not what happened in these cases. And so far this year, it doesn't seem, all indications are that there's a lot of prey out there. And so this is really more of a ship strike issue. And I wanna talk, just a little bit about ship strikes because I think there's, one, there's a lot of work happening on ship strikes um, right now and over the next couple of years. So there's, there's four common whales that are found off the coast of, of our area, the gray whale, which we just saw, humpbacks and blue whales, the largest animal on the planet, and then fin whales. Um, this chart here shows that blues, fins, and humpbacks are all endangered, and this is their population size for the North Pacific stock in the California, Oregon, Washington stock. So there's only about a thousand blue whales in this stock. And there's only about 3000 humpback whales. But we've calculated, scientists have calculated, okay, well, there's gonna be natural mortality and then there's gonna be replacement through birth, but how many could we remove aside from natural mortality and still maintain a stable population? And this is what I think is really interesting. 
the number of blue whales, because they're so slow to grow and age, the number of blue whales we can remove from the population non-naturally is only 1.2 per year. And the number of humpbacks is only 16.7. That's not very many. And so there's a lot of work to try to keep this non-natural mortality low. Uh, in 2013, and this, a lot of this was driven by the sanctuaries which surround the entrance to San Francisco Bay. Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary here, Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary here, and Monterey National uh, Marine Sanctuary to the south. Um, but the dark lines here, the black lines show the old shipping lanes in and out of San Francisco. So you come in from the north, the ships would come in this way, they'd come in here, and they'd come in this way from the south. So in 2013, effort was made to extend those shipping lanes to try to move the ships across the areas where we know the whales are as quickly as possible. So they can't run along an area where there's a lot of whales, they just move out as quickly as possible. And so they move ships away from whales that may or may not have had a little bit and made a difference. And in 2015 to present, um, there's been a big project with shipping companies asking them to slow down at certain times of year um, as they're in these areas when we think whales are present. And so shipping companies have done a great job of slowing down to 10 knots in these areas. This is also happening um, in the Santa Barbara Channel, just south of Point Conception, because that's another area of ship strikes. And so, but even with about 78% of ships slowing down, it hasn't made that big a difference. And so this is the number of ship strikes recorded. Here's 2012 and 13 when those uh, changes began to happen. And it looks like it may have made a little bit of a difference, but 2018 and 19, we had quite a few ship strikes. And these blue ones at the top, that's one blue whale per year. That's one blue whale per year that we know about that dies from a ship strike, perhaps because it comes ashore, perhaps because they get hung up on the bow of the ship. And so this is still an issue that's going on. Um, and the Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary and the Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary just formed a, a joint working group to continue to address this issue because even with slowing the ships down and even if we got almost 100 percent compliance there's no guarantee that we're they basically think even with 100 percent compliance we're still going to hit enough whales that the blue whale population will continue to decrease this threatened population so there's a lot of and there's a lot of work happening with the shipping industries with research to try to solve this problem and this is sort of a potential, this is what's happening off Santa Barbara. And this is something that Farallon Institute's involved in. You can have passive acoustics recording the sounds of whales so we know when they're in that local area. There's people on the water who are observing whales. There's people out there naturally to have a place where they can report in when there are whales. Um, Farallon Institute's pretty expert at using satellite data to collect oceanographic information that tells us basically habitat models. How likely is it that blue whales are in the area? Or how likely is it that their prey sources are in the area? And feeding all that information back in so ships coming through the area have an understanding of how likely it is that they're gonna hit a whale. So this is something that will probably happen over the next few years, um, but it's certainly being worked on right now. So I, I'm gonna wrap up right now. I wanna end with just a little bit of a what we can do and i don't have much really for plastics i, I sort of want to tell a story that you know a couple of years ago my 14 year old son he came to us and my wife and i and he said all right i'm doing a school project we're gonna stop having any plastic in this house for a month and i said great let's let's see what we can do let's try our best and i think a lot of people have done this people have tried to reduce their level of plastic and i would just want to say it's hard it's not the easiest thing to do when you go to the supermarket and you see all the things wrapped in plastic. Um, and I was taking a walk with a friend the other day who said, oh yeah, I'm, we're doing this in our house and I feel like the best I'm doing is a B minus. And I said, you know, Stephen, I think a B minus, like is, it's hard to do. And so don't beat yourself over, over a B minus. I think this is something that we all need to make efforts to reduce our plastic, particularly our single use plastic. Um, and that's really, I think, something that a lot of people have become aware of. And I think it's just something that we need to continue to be aware of. And I think, you know, industry is taking is taking action by trying to package things in things that are not plastic. 
Um, so that's really all I'm going to say about plastic. I don't want to go in, in too depth. About overfishing, I think this is actually an easy one for me, and it's a great one to support local resources. So Monterey Bay Aquarium, I, I know everyone knows it, puts out a seafood watch consumer guide, right? They um, they can tell you exactly what fish are sustainably caught and which ones are not, which ones are to avoid. Um, there's also, you know, a lot of people use community supported agriculture. There's community supported fisheries as well. And so you can buy locally, you can buy straight from people who are doing fishing, fishing locally. And then I love this book because the, the main goal of this book uh, fish forever is about learning how to cook what's being caught off your coast. So, you know, most Americans know how to cook shrimp. Uh, they know how to cook tuna and they might know how to cook salmon and they cook them even when they're not in season, but learning how to cook sand dabs when they're in, in season off your coast. I think that's a, a big part of um, beginning to address overfishing by, by learning to cook what's being sustainably caught. And then addressing climate change is, is also a tough one. I, I, put sort of four different levels here, what you can do at the individual level, um, your company and community level and state and federal. And I've really left state and federal off because uh, perhaps you have connections uh, into that world, but I think most of us don't. And so what happens at the state and federal level happens because we elect the people we elect. And, you know, I, so I don't really want to address those, but I do want to talk about individual, you know, understanding your particular carbon footprint is important. It's something my family did uh, within the last couple of years. And we found out that airline miles, actually flying to see family was a big part of our carbon footprint. And you can reduce that by, by changing the way you fly, uh, or excuse me, by maybe not flying, but also if you wanna see family, by, by using carbon offsets and finding the best carbon offset problem, uh, programs. There's lots you can do there. And, and I would also say, um, Another way we can make an impact is by influencing our network. And maybe that's a company we work for, the community we exist in. It may be working at the community level on climate action plans that exist in every city around the Bay Area, I'm sure. Or it might be working within your community. And this is, a, I think, the perfect time to do it where at Fairlawn Institute, we spend a lot of time going to conferences. Um, and COVID-19 has taught us that we don't need to do that. We don't need to, and I'm sure if you work in a business, you've learned that maybe I don't need to fly all around to do my meetings. So I think this is a great opportunity to influence the communities that you're a part of um, to address sort of your carbon footprint. Um, I'm gonna, I'd like to ask you all just to, you know, what I've talked about here hasn't been necessarily directly related to Farallon Institute. But I really believe in what Farallon Institute does, um, oceanographic research for sustainable and healthy oceans. I invite you to go to Farallon Institute and learn more about our organization. Um, what I think is actually the most amazing thing about Farallon Institute is the team. Um, these are just some of our principal scientists. Marisol Garcia Reyes in the upper left is an amazing atmospheric scientist and oceanographer. Um, she works to understand uh, most recently, you know, what drives kelp populations and what environmental drivers make them more healthy or not. Uh, the woman in the left of your screen is Shell Gentleman. Uh, Shell works with, she does amazing things, but most recently she partnered with Jet Propulsion Laboratory, who has put the Mars rover up on Mars. Um, Shell and JPL have designed a satellite and they're planning to launch it in about four years to measure air and sea heat and moisture fluxes. And the whole goal is to extend our weather forecasting capabilities from two months or from two weeks to four weeks. It's an incredibly dynamic project that only someone like Shell could do. Um, and, you know, other folks here, the person in the lower right is Bill Seidman. He spent 10 years of his life out on the Farallon Islands studying seabirds. Uh, Julie in the middle there has um, run a seabird survey on Alcatraz Island for the last 25 years. Um, this is an amazing group of people doing really great science and making a difference. And every one of these people sits on some sort of board, some sort of decision-making body to try to make a difference. And so I encourage you to support us at Farallon Institute if you'd like to, but I'd also encourage you to come up and have lunch with us. It's a great group of people who really love the work they do, love to share it with people who are interested. And I think sometimes science can feel like a closed community and we try to make ours a little bit open. So 
I'll leave it there. I'm happy to, I'd be happy to have anyone reach out to me after the talk. I'd be happy to answer any questions. And yeah, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, do, do we have a question? Do we have time for one question? Does anybody have a specific question they think they like to ask now or? Okay, great. Great. Um, I actually, if, if I can ask a question about the, the krill industry, um, everybody now is saying that krill oil and krill is so good. How much impact is that having on um, the krill that the poor whales <laughs> need to eat? Yeah. Let me just, let me stop sharing my screen, Alexandra. Um, it has a big impact and that all the krill fishing, most of the krill fishing happens uh, down off Antarctica. It's pretty amazing the way it happens. They have nets that they put in the water and they just a big tube attached to the back of the net, which the net which sucks it up on board and it's immediately flash frozen. They can keep the net in the water for months on end and just continually fish krill. Um, it has a big impact down there depending on where they take it from. There's a lot of central place foraging colonies of whether it be penguins or other um, marine mammals, different leopard seals, that sort of thing. And if they take too much from a certain area, those colonies don't move, right? And so those penguins have a limited foraging range. And so it can have a big impact there. We actually had um, a scientist who worked on that using models to model krill extraction from various areas around um, Antarctic and different marine protected areas to look at that. But it certainly can have a big impact if done, uh, if not spread out in the right areas. Okay, all right. So um, thank you so, so much. Um, go ahead, Bati. Yeah, sorry, I think there's a question in the chat. Um, Hannah is saying, um, I have a house in Stinson Beach. What can I say to my neighbors about our bay to encourage, inspire participation and awareness? Do you mean Bellina, probably Bellinas Lagoon? I'm guessing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, so Bellinas Lagoon, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, Bellinas Lagoon is kind of a, a really neat area because there's so many seals that go in there to rest and to pup in there. So I think that's probably the biggest thing that I would call out from my knowledge of Bellinas Lagoon um, is is sort of, you know, it, is that it's it really is sort of this, hat, I, don't, I don't want to call it a hatchery, but it's a resting place for all these young pups. And, you know, that's, that's a pretty amazing part of the lagoon. I don't know too much more about it. My knowledge of Stinson Beach is really just from being there as not as a scientist, but more as a, a community member being on the beach. Great, great. Thank you. Um, we're actually running out of time, but I did want to let everybody know, and this is a small group and this is great because what we're going to want to do um, on May 6th is have a discussion about Bat Battery Earth and what people would like to do, where they would like to see it going and, and things like that. And then we're hoping that this talk today everybody can help us get the word out about the Farallon Islands. And when people talk about climate change or that you hear that there, there's a, a whale there, you can say, well, we actually went to this talk, we heard the Farallon Islands and visit their site and learn more about what they're doing and try to help educate other people about ship strikes and what are happening. And maybe if you work for um, some companies and you're interested in financially supporting the um, Farallon Institute, I know that they, they would like that. Or if you have um, companies that would like to work with them, they have ideas or resources and, and things like that. You can always get in touch with us and we'll put you in touch with them or contact Jeff directly. But we thought this was a good um, kind of brainstorming um, happy hour that we're gonna have, but to just kind of think of, of, of how you would wanna be involved in, in this and the type of people that you'd like to meet and, and what you think you might have to offer. So we'll do that on May 6th, I think that's about six o'clock we'll be um, posting that. So thank you so much, Joe, and I'll pass it on to you. I don't know if you have to close anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you very much for every, everybody for joining. Uh, Jeffrey was like, really informative and I'm looking forward to what the Battery Earth uh, members you know, can bring to the table and, 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 and grow the community and also support, support our community um, outside of the club as well. Great, thank you so much. Thank, thank, you, everybody. Everybody. thank you everybody. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.